What's going on, fam? It is I, Archbishop Belmont, from the illustrious noble house of Belmont, Archbishop for the Third Temple English Church of England, as well as heir, descendant from the Kingdom of England, Empire of Albion, as well as the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which you all know today as so-called the Kingdom of England. Um, this video this build is going to be very important because today what's going on in the so-called United States, which we know is, uh, let's just say, affiliated with the East Indian Company, which are still underneath the Kingdom of Great Britain or Great Britain itself. This video, you know, is one of the, I would say, one of my better ones. Um because now we're living in a time where no longer playing around with this information you know it's been here for a very very long time um as heirs are still experiencing burdens and undue hardship outside with the original charters um going back to the to the colonies uh stipulated and then not even just the charters but going all the way back to the time when our Anglo-Saxon kings, like King um, Edward the Confessor, um, King Ethelred the Unready, as well our Jesus Christ, King Edgar the Peaceful, when they existed, and that was when our long or our last so-called uh, known Anglo-Saxon Berber uh, kings were running the kingdom, because in 1066 then you have um, Edward, the, uh, excuse me, you have William the Conqueror. He may have been related, but he was not based off of the descendants of, um, of Alfred the Great. If I'm not mistaken, he married a descendant of Alfred the Great. But he himself was not a descendant of Alfred the Great. And Alfred the Great, we know, was known as the Wise Elf. Um, because for you who don't know, that um, Anglo-Saxon or the House of Wessex were descendants of elves. Elf blood. Um, but we're not going to talk about that in this video. You know, that's something we're going to speak about uh, further down the road. Or unless you go to the Third Temple English Church of England's YouTube page, then you'll be able to uh, watch the video where I was speaking about the elves. Um, but yes, we are known as elves, angels, um, however you want to you know, call us. It's all going to go back to the history of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and in this case, we're known as the White Elves, for those who don't know. But, that's, once again, it's not what this video is about. This video is specifically going to be talking about the time frame when the United States was created and the Madhouse Act. And why I'm going to be speaking about these two is because the Madhouse Act have to deal with mental health. It to deal with... Um, the time where the king of Great Britain um, was placed in, which we will say he was considered, I would say non compos mentis um, after a certain time and after 1783, where he was so-called signed, uh, excuse me, we so-called signed the uh, Treaty of Paris. But prior to 1783, um, he was known as so-called having declining health regarding his mental. So, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what probably was going on, but I'm going to speculate um, that there could have been some foul play, especially to get him to relinquish his control of crown land because what king will relinquish his right and control of his property, you know, unless there was some type of ulterior motives that was taking place or if there was someone who was working behind the crown or behind the throne. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this, this bill. Um, because time is of the essence, you know, and only us heirs can do this work. I don't expect anyone else going to come and tell you who we are and teach our true history because they are not us. Same way those colonists who wanted the right to the Englishmen who weren't Englishmen. They wanted our rights and they couldn't get our rights. So they had to create something new and then they're 
new creation, they were still tied to the to the company or the colony that they did descend from, i.e., they were still descendants of Roman Catholics, still tied to the crown of Great Britain or the British monarchs. In the way how you slice and dice it. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. All right, so what I have right here on the screen for those who are viewing and for those in the future who are going to be viewing this, this is the astrological chart of the United States. And yes, we do believe and practice astrology here. Why? Because as above, so below, as within, so without. Our predecessors knew that astrology was, uh, was part of the waking world or the physical world and so we recognize it as part of the physical world okay so what this says July 4th 1776 which you know was considered the day or the Declaration of Independence which took place in Philadelphia Pennsylvania it happened at 5 10 p.m. which was equivalent to 22 10 Eastern to, um, Universal Time all right now why this information is important is because how the inform the energy that's played out with the United States during this time is their energy for the rest of their existence. Now, anyone who claimed to be underneath the United States or a United States citizen, this is how this energy affects you. I repeat, this is how the energy affects you. So, the most important energy or planet I'm going to be referencing during this time is the one that you know causes the most mischief or transformation within our reality the same planet that played a lot of transformational uh, overtones during 1776 and even prior for those astrologists who understand that we don't predict the future um, we just understand the past and how the past played out is how the future plays out. Okay? The biggest player during the creation of the United States, planetary-wise, was Pluto. I repeat, the planet or asteroid or whichever one to call it, um, dwarf planet, whatever, Pluto, was the benefactor of the creation of the United States. Because during the time... Pluto was inside Capricorn. Let's go ahead and look at the chart. 1776, July 4th. We have Pluto. Pluto is P. Pluto was in the second house. The second house deal with the house of values. That was the house of Capricorn. Now, we all know Capricorn is the Earth sign. Capricorn represents literally planet Earth. All right, he's the ruler of the Midheaven which is normally the 10th house, depending on how your chart set up, it could be the 11th house, whatever. But he's the ruler of the 10th house. So that's like career. That's your career. That's what you're going to be known for in the physical world when you're dealing with people, you know, what you can see. Pluto was in the second house. That's the house of values, um, which house is normally ruled by Taurus, which is normally Taurus is ruled by Venus. So Venus and Saturn both work together you know venus is actually you know not saying exalted in saturn but you know she's in a neutral position she's in a position where it's not going to cause her any issues because saturn and venus once again they work together okay so you have pluto here in the second house all right pluto been here in the second house the house of values that means that during the time 
that the so-called colonists created the, the Declaration of Independence, their values were being changed up, i.e. being transformed. Because you can see the degrees that Pluto was in at this time. He was in 27 degrees, which meant that he was getting ready to transform into the house of Aquarius, which is the uh, Aquarius, if you know, is the humanitarian. You know, Aquarius deal with, you know, the futuristic things in this case. And the creation of the United States itself of America was a future creation, a new community, a new reality, a new nation. But remember, it was created in the sign of Capricorn, which is a house, excuse me, which is an earth sign. All right. So that means that what was taking place on the earth at this time was very transformational, which we see what was happening was what? The separation from those who were underneath chattel property of the of Great Britain to now start create their own new reality or the new society. All right. So why this is important, let's go ahead and go to the Madhouse Act because it's during the same time that the Madhouse Act was created. The Madhouse Act of 1774. All right. Now we understand that the year now Gregorian calendar wise is 2022. And guess who's in the sign of Capricorn in the year 2022? Yes, you guessed it. Pluto. Pluto is here right now in the sign of Capricorn. Now, in 1774, Pluto was in the sign of Capricorn. So what we're doing, we're just repeating history. You know, we're going back in time to see what happened back then. Because what happened back then is going to be happening right now. All right. So let's read. The Madhouse Act 1774. The Madhouse Act 1774 was an act of the Parliament of Great Britain which set out a legal framework for regulating madhouses, i.e. insane asylums. All right. So during the time of the United States creation, they had been created during the time that the Madhouse Act, i.e. to regulate madhouses. Now, if you understand that the United States itself was created based off of, you know, them sending... Uh, criminals and all that over here to so-called work the colonies and we know most criminals most criminals are mentally deranged you know they're outside their mind i.e. non compass mentis okay background it says by the mid 18th century the common methods in the United States or the United Kingdom excuse me for dealing with the insane were either to keep them in the family home or put them in a madhouse which was simply a private house whose proprietor was paid to detain their residents. Remember, key word, proprietors. We already know that through the reign of Queen Anne, that the proprietors gave all of their property back to the crown. But here they're speaking and saying that the proprietors were actually other proprietors. Remember, there's other different proprietors. Like, for instance, today, everyone in so-called America, ab initio, was considered sole proprietors. All right, so they're not saying what type of proprietor. They're saying proprietors. So whose proprietors were paid to detain their residents and ran it as a commercial concern with little or no medical involvement. This led to two forms of abuse. The first was the keeping of legitimately insane people in atrocious conditions, and the second, the detention of those who were falsely claimed to be insane, in effect, private imprisonment. All right, so pause. So during this time, you once again, these are people who were considered insane, and those who probably wasn't considered insane, it was the fact that they had legislation passed that gave those who was underneath the jurisdiction of Great Britain to enact laws or forms of legislation to deal with the problem. Now, why this is important is because today we see that there's more insane asylums and not just insane asylums, but there's a plethora or an influx of mental health issues that's taking place within here of the so-called United States. Now, if you've been paying attention to the past videos, you see that the United States is still what? crown property or doing business on crown property why because the united states is still an affiliation or an extension of the east indian company this is not my words all you have to do is go verify it all right and it said that they were in prison even those who was falsely claimed to be insane so let's say for instance people today who are speaking the truth regarding like history uh law um anything that seemed to go against the status quo are and can be so-called uh, labeled as being out of their mind crazy you know words that you always hear people say today today um all the time today when like when you 
speaking some truth that they didn't know about. Like, damn, that sounds crazy. Don't realize that the ramification of saying information that you're speaking about is actually crazy because that can literally get you labeled as, you know, <laughs> mentally unsound, i.e. non compus mentis. Okay, let's continue. So it says, at this stage, there was no legislation to regulate the incarceration of anyone other than a transitory lunatic or a pauper. So like poor people was automatically being labeled mentally unstable. No difference than we see today. You know, when you see somebody who's poor living on the streets, you automatically start thinking like, man, what the hell going on with them? Was mentally not right with them? What screws are unloose or what screws are loose? You know, doesn't necessarily um, tell you that these people might actually be mentally sound. You know, it's just based off of how historically they're labeled. All right. It says there was one only a vaguely defined common law. And we know there's only one common law, and that's the common law of England. Power to confine a person disordered in mind who seems disposed to do mischief to himself or to another person. All right. In the case in the mid 1750s, a woman came to suspect that her son in law had committed his wife to a madhouse in Hoxton with the aid of a justice of the peace. So, you hear this? So, like, justice of the peace were actually helping um, those who they actually were in cahoots with to have either family, as you see in this case, wife, um, committed into the madhouse. Now, during this time, you did not want to be committed in the madhouse. It's no different than now. You don't want somebody to have you labeled as mentally unstable, unsound, and then that's actually on your record because then you will have a hard time in society to be able to and speaking up anything because first thing first they're going to do, they're going to go back to your past history, i.e. pull up your, your chart. In this case, your medical records. And if it sees that you was considered mentally unstable, you diagnose as one of these terms, to consider underneath the medical uh, medical health regime, that was considered almost like assassination of your character. You didn't want to be labeled <laughs> mentally unstable. All right. So it says she secured the release of her daughter after obtaining a confession from the husband. A similar case in 1762 saw a man trying to obtain the release of an acquaintance, one of Mrs. Hawley, who he suspected had confined. Uh, had been confined at a madhouse. His initial application to Lord Mansfield for a writ of habeas corpus, or we could say produce corpus, which means produce the body, because habeas means have, was rejected because he was not a relative and so had no standing. But the judge arranged for a doctor to visit the house and speak to the woman. On his report, a writ was granted. She was brought before the court and discharged. Okay? So... But a habeas corpus or a de corpus, that means that you have to bring the body in front of the judge and then you can go ahead and plead your case depending on what the situation is. All right. A select committee of the House of Commons chaired by Thomas Townshed was set up in 1763. Now, we know 1763 was also the, also the year of the uh, proclamation of 1763 that was passed by King George III that prevent colonists from going past the Appalachian Mountains which is considered one of the boundary marks for the colonists. All right. Um, to study the problem of unlawful detention in private madhouses and focus on the Hawley case, it found that she had been committed to the house solely on the word of her husband, who paid two guineas, which were two pounds and two shillings. A month of her board that she was unable to leave the house or communicate with anybody outside it. Seems to be the same situation here in America. The inmates were treated as insane, but the agent who arranged their entry freely admitted that he had committed a single insane person to the house in the past six years. No one who would pay was turned away. No physicians attended the inmates and no register was kept of their name. So you hear this? So you had folks who was getting locked up during this time that was labeled as insane by so-called family members or someone who had a connection to them and their names weren't even being written down and uh, noted, notated that they were actually in these insane asylums. All right. Um, this was the committee stated a common situation. So this is common. They noted that a number of similar cases could have been studied and they recommended as some form of legislation intervention was needed. The comments ordered the committee to prepare a bill, but it appears that it was never brought in. The issue was not addressed in 1773 when Townshed's son, excuse me, 
The issue was next addressed in 1773 when Tom Shedd's son, also named Thomas Tom Shedd, sponsored a bill to regulate private mine houses within seven miles of London. This would be the responsibility of the Royal College of Physicians, so like the hospitals, doctors, and outside that, magistrates, like your so-called local government municipalities and county towns. The bill passed the Commons but was rejected by the Lords. All right. So legislative history says in 1774, Thomas Townshed again reintroduced the Madhouse Bill. The bill was presented to the Commons for its first reading on March 2nd and was amended in committee on March 23rd. The Lords voted on it on April 21st and made two amendments, the addition of Statute 19 and Statute 31 and on May 6th before the bill returned to the Commons on May 10th. The bill received royal dissent on May 20th. So that shows you that the King of Great Britain at this time agreed for this to happen um, or approved the Madhouse Act. All right. It right, says so the provisions, it says the act required that all madhouses be licensed by a committee of the Royal College of Physicians. This license will permit the holder to maintain a single house for accommodated lunatics and will have to be renewed each year. All houses were to be inspected at least once per year by the committee who will also keep a central register of all the confined lunatics in order that people could locate them. Outside London, the task of inspecting them will fall to the local quarter sessions. Local quarter sessions are... Let it pop up. Okay, it didn't pop up this time. Let's see. All right, well, wait. The penalty for concealing or confining more than one insane person without a license was set at 500 pounds, and every keeper of such a house who took in the patient without an order from a doctor was liable to 100 pounds. All right? It says, implementation. The act took effect on November 20th, 1774, six months after receiving royal assent and was originally stated to remain in force for five years and then until the end of the next parliamentary session. It was continued for a further seven years by the Madhouse Continuation Act of 1779. Now, pause. Why this is important right here is because, remember, 1776 was supposed to have been the separation, i.e. the Declaration of Independence. But right in here, it says that it continued seven years of Madhouse from um, seven-year continuation the Madhouse Act of 1779 would let you know that during the time of their so-called separation, they were still enforcing uh, legislation for Parliament. All right. It said, and then continue indefinitely by the Madhouse Law Perpetuation Act of 1786. It remained in force until repealed by the Madhouse Act of 1828. So from 1774 all the way to so-called 1828, the Madhouse Act from Great Britain was in fact here in the so-called territory that you call what? the United States and the United States is what it's still a company of the East, uh, still a company of Great Britain and affiliated with the East Indian Company okay now this info is, is key to know um, because now we're going to go to pause this one second Okay, so now we, we have here is speaking about because we talked about the commissioners, excuse me, about the Madhouse Act. But now we need to go ahead and talk about the commissioners and lunacy because their uh, origins is tied to the Madhouse Act, or we can go back to the Lunacy Act. But we're going to go ahead and talk about what they are saying, the commissioners and lunacy, who they were, and how they got started. All right, so it says the Commissioners in Lunacy or the Lunacy Commission were a body, or excuse me, a public body established by the Lunacy Act 1845 to oversee asylums and the welfare of mentally ill people in England and Wales. It succeeded the Metropolitan Commissioners in Lunacy. All right, previous bodies said the predecessors of the Commissioners in Lunacy were the Metropolitan Commissioners in Lunacy dating back to the Madhouse Act of 1774, which we just spoke about. And established as such by the Madhouse Act 1828. By 1842, their remit had been extended from London to cover the whole country. The Lord Chancellor's jurisdiction over lunatics, so found by writ of De Lunatico in Corriendo, had been delegated to two masters in chancery. By the Lunacy Act 1842, um, which was done during the reign of Victoria, 
These were established as the Commissioners of Lunacy, and after 1845, they were retitled Masters of Lunacy. All right. So we're going to go down and see where asylums was commissioned. The filing of asylums were commissioned under the auspices of the Commissioners of Lunacy or their predecessors. English County Asylums, you have right here. I'm not going to read them. You can go through them your own time. Okay. And successors to the Commission of Lunacy, as you see, is the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913, which replaced the commission with the Board of Control for Lunacy and Mental Deficiencies. So it went from Madhouse Act to dealing with uh, so-called lunatics, which were still considered non corpus mentis, down to which we see uh, mental health. So when we speak about mental health today, we have to know the origins of what mental health come from, which goes all the way back to the Madhouse Act. All right. And we know that the United States itself was underneath the Madhouse Act of 1774, 75. All right. And before their so-called separation of 1776, even after their so-called separation of 1776, these acts were still applicable. Okay. And then here we have the Lunacy Act of 1845. It says the Lunacy or the Lunatics Act of 1845, which was done during the reign of Victoria, and the County Asylums Act of 1845 formed mental health law in England and Wales from 1845 to 1890. The Lunacy Act's most important provision was a change in the status of mentally ill people to patients. You hear this? So folks who's considered mentally ill, now in their status or the term that they called them were patients. So when you go into the hospital, don't they call you a patient? <laughs> See, but they never tell you what type of patient you are, you know? They always know you as a patient. But as we see, the status of mentally ill people was turned to patients. So they don't know who are you, okay? And we know that most hospitals are operating like a madhouse, all right? It says, background, prior to the Lunacy Act, Lunacy legislation in England was enshrined in the County Asylums Act of 1808, which established institutions for poor and criminally insane, mentally ill people. Most of the people today, you know, who are living paycheck to paycheck will qualify as being, quote unquote, uh, non compos mentis or paupers or insane, um, excuse me, or criminally insane based off of the fact that they're poor. The institutions were called asylums and they gave refuge where mental illness could receive proper treatment. The first asylum owing to the County Asylums Act opened in Northampton in 1811. By 1827, however, only nine county asylums had opened and many patients were still in gaol, that's jail, as prisoners and criminals. So it says that patients were still, like, mentally insane patients were actually in so-called in jail. As a consequence of this slow progress, the Lunacy Act 1845 created the Lunacy Commission to focus on lunacy legislation. The act was championed by Anthony Ashley Cooper, 7th Earl of Shaftesbury. Shaftesbury was the head of commission from its founding in 1845 until his death in 1885. The Lunacy Commission was made up of 11 metropolitan commissioners. The commission was monumental as it was not only a full-time commission, but it was also salary for six of its members. The six members of the commission that were full-time and salary were made up of three members of the legal system and three members of the medical community. The other five members of the commission were all honorary members that simply had to attend board meetings. The duty of commission was to establish and carry out provisions of the act. All right. And let's read, it says 1845, Children of the Lunacy Act, 1845. It says... When the Lunacy Act was passed in 1845, there were many questions raised about what to do with children and poor mental health. Insane children were more common than is commonly appreciated. The confusion arose because the Act gave no age limits on patients in the asylums. You hear this? So you had children, which you will call kids, no matter, depending on what their age at, were actually patients in the insane asylum. 
Now, what children do you know should be in this so-called insane asylum? Madhouse. And you got to think about it. A lot of these children grew up to become adults. And these adults did what? Had children of their own. You are who you come from. Which means that many of the children who were born from these adults that was mentally insane was still labeled as children of mentally insane. Which means you're still a patient. All right. Some of the inspections conducted by the Lunacy Commission involved inspecting workhouses where the commission would often find mentally unhealthy children and press for them to be removed. However, many of the asylums were hesitant to admit children because of this, some children were admitted under the guise that they were in urgent need of help and constituted a serious danger to themselves and others. That sounds similar to what they say a lot of people who uh, are getting locked up today that they're considered um a threat to society and themselves it's the same language that they were utilizing within the lunacy act of 1845 for children all right and we know children should be considered minors and so the term minor they're still utilizing on adults today okay and when they say minors today on adults you notice the classification or the so-called the people who they're call, calling minors Pay attention to that because minor doesn't mean because of your so-called a different skin tone. Minor doesn't mean that you're a minor at mind, i.e. you're considered not at the mind of a majority or knowing the proper information that you need to know regarding who you are and your origins as well as the history and the laws that you are underneath. So the fact that you don't know this history automatically places you underneath the status of non compass mentis, but also too since the, uh, the creation of the chart, excuse me, since the col colonial time, which was still underneath, um, all children who was underneath their mother, part two sequitur, wouldn't them. The, and you don't know this, will still place you underneath the status of non compass mentis. Okay? Which means unsound mind. Which they have a lot of our ladies uh, listed as, as unsound mind. And once again, we all come from a mother, which means that if your mother was of unsound mind, then that means that you as a child is considered of unsound mind until you become the mind or the age of majority, which you understand this information, and then you pull yourself into the proper status, which will separate you from being either a award of the madhouse to being a so-called proper upstanding subject of the kingdom. But if you don't even know any history regarding the kingdom of England and the Great Britain, then you by default is underneath the madhouse act. All right, let's see. I don't want this video to be too long. Okay, and for you who don't understand non corpus mentis and the origins, it says non corpus mentis is a Latin legal phrase that translates to of unsound mind, known, which means not pretty faces, corpus mentis, meaning having control of one's mind. So that means non corpus mentis means you don't have control of your own mind. This phrase was first used in 13th century English law to describe people afflicted by madness, the loss of memory or ability to reason. Usage. The status of non corpus mentis applied to those who were not who were not mad from birth, but became so later in life through no fault of their own. So like for instance the fact that you no one ever taught you this information and stuff like like that, no fault of your own, that makes you still non corpus mentis. The property interest of such a person could be committed to another party to conserve and administer them for the duration of their madness. All these so called governments that you're underneath well, underneath what the APA the Administrative Procedure Act why because you're all labeled as non compass mentis dead decedents or those who cannot control their own affairs I'm not making this up they're writing this out for you their criminal culpability was also limited except in cases of high treason this contrast with natural fools who were mad from birth and whose property interest passed to the crown and habitual drunkards who could claim no defensive madness <laughs> All right. And prosecution of suicide. So for those brothers and sisters, you know, um, you know, my condolences who had took themselves off this earthly plane because they couldn't control themselves and whatever other issues they were going with, you know, I, I feel for you and I understand, but I'm at this, I'm reading the history regarding how all this compiled. So, like I said, non corpus mentis and the fellow they say, which is Latin word for self murder, presented two different verdicts in a case of a suicide. 
and the fighting for jury, the deceased who was stigmatized, fellow they say, would be excluded from burial in consecrated ground and would forfeit their estate to the crown, while these penalties would not apply to the deceased affirmed non corpus mentis. Suicide was a severe crime in Tudor and early story England and was considered a form of murder. You hear this? So suicide was considered murder. A sin not only in the eyes of the church but also defined by criminal law. The state of mind of self-killers at the time they committed their fatal deed was crucial. To be judged guilty of self-murder, one had to be sane. Men and women who killed themselves when they were mad or otherwise mentally incompetent were considered innocent. The verdict would be made by jury. The penalty for suicide in England originated in the ancient world and evolved gradually into their early modern form. Similar laws and customs existed in many parts of Europe. Born of domestic beliefs, the ritual of punishing suicide, which is usually concerned with the suicidal corpse, embodies the notion that suicide is polluting and that the suicide should be ostracized by the community of the living and the dead. The theological and legal severity increased in the high Middle Ages. The medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas extended Augustine's arguments against suicide and added the new interpretation of violation of natural law to it. Most Western European governments began to promulgate laws to confiscate some of a suicide's property. However, attitudes to suicide changed profoundly after 1660. Following the English Revolution, after the Civil War, political and social changes, judicial and ecclesiastical severity gave way to official leniency for most people who died by suicide. Non corpus mentis verdicts increased greatly, and fellow they say verdicts became as rare as non corpus mentis had been two centuries earlier. However, the laws against suicide and the verdicts fellow they say and non corpus mentis did not fade until the late 19th century. <laughs> Alright? So, as we see during the time of the Tudors and Stuarts, suicide was considered murder. You know, Depending on if you're considered sane or non corpus mentis. If you're considered non corpus mentis, it's considered innocent. If you're considered sane, then clearly it was, you was considered guilty that you killed, you know, yourself and your property could be confiscated. So you don't want to be labeled, period, out of your mind or doing things that you, you know, that were considered to be insane during these times. Um, including, like I said, suicide, because trust and believe, if they saw you commit a suicide, chances are they were going to constitute you as being legally insane. All right. Now, I draw you right back to the chart of the United States. Once again, July 4th, 1776, because you can see during that time, 76, 75, 74. Pluto was inside Capricorn, and Pluto is a very, very slow-moving planet, which means it's a generational. All right, and since history repeats itself, we're right back in Pluto being in Capricorn, which the same things are taking place today. We have seen a lot of suicides happen. A lot of people consider non corpus mentis, i.e., you're seeing brothers, like I said, losing their mind. We've seen women or sisters losing their mind. You're seeing the degradation of the family. You're seeing the degradation of society. All this is considered mad, you know, outside what the church ordained and created for the civility of of um, of humanity. You know, right now people are losing their humanities and it's because of we're repeating a cycle and for us to actually not fall for the same uh, for the same uh, malarkey. We need to understand what happened during this time so that way we can pull ourselves out. You know, that's why you must become a time traveler. And so in this case, once again, and I'm going to end this video is you need to know that the Madhouse Act is still applicable here in the so-called United States. Why? Because the United States is successor to the crown. So any law of parliament that was passed during that time, especially during the colonies, or are still in full effect. They haven't went anywhere. They may be considered obsolete, but they have not been repealed. So with that being said... You know, I love you. Um, this is not something that should be taken lightly, especially when it comes down to understanding the history of um, of the United States, i.e. Uh, the company of Great Britain, which is still affiliated with the East Indian Company. So, you know, so as we are rising um, from our, 
you know, our lower depths of consciousness, uh, we start having to accept things for what they are. So that way that we make sure that we're not, you know, that we're not caught up in the wrong predicaments. So with that being said, you know, please like, share, subscribe. Um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and email the Third Temple English Church at gmail.com. I would like to give honors to our King Clifford Jefferson as well as our Queen Godwin from the House of Godwin who have returned to help um, reinvigorate, you know, the English history as well as the the crown, the English crown. You know, so therefore that we can actually be saved during this day and time um, where we need to be able to be saved the most. You know, and so if this sounds like who you are, then you know how to contact us, how to get in hold to us and if this information you know if it if you feel that it's not you then let it fly you know because we only come for those who recognize and have the conviction within their heart know that this is who they are so that being said i love you peace and love we'll see you on the flip side